this has been a year and a half of higher rates that has built up to this moment. And now we're about to go into January where it normally takes off and we have all this pent up demand and retracted market. So what I'm saying is, is right now, here's the opportunity right now. You got to get as many listings as you can in December because everything in January is going under contract. And if you do, if you let this moment go by where you don't take advantage and stack up as much inventory as you can, when January hits and you're busy, you're selling, you'll be doing good and everything, but you're going to wish to God you would have stacked up as many listings as you could. Now, while things are slow, while you have time to actually do it before the wave actually hits and you don't have time to do it anymore, plus the wave's hitting, it's too late. You got to get you at, well, when do you prepare for a market surge? During the surge or before the surge? Okay. Before, and that's right now. And every day that goes by is just one more day of a lost opportunity because these days are clicking by real fast. And we, we starting last week, we had four full work weeks with no holidays in between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Christmas is going to hit Monday in like three weeks. You had four full work weeks between Thanksgiving and Christmas to really crush it. to like time block prospecting and go harder than you've ever went before. That's what you need to be doing. And a lot of us during this time of year, we kind of just lay back. Well, the market's slow. You know, what's the use? People aren't doing anything anyway. Listings are just sitting there. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. This is the calm before the storm. If you want, if you want to be like massive, like, like high, high producer, you've got to realize these cycles and take advantage of the moments. Otherwise, you're just going to be following the sheep, the rest of the agents in the, in the industry and just be average or be a low producer. And just stay there forever. Yeah, this is the kind of stuff that I started realizing in 2008. These ebbs and flows of the market and how to take advantage of the down moments to, to you know, to ramp up before the next surge happens. Yeah, this is it right now. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> just a little pep talk for you. Um, let's see if you guys have some questions. I'd love to dig into some of your specific situations. And if not, I can just keep rambling because I can ramble all day long. <laughs> Feel free to unmute, right? Unmute. Tell me what's going on in your business. Come on in, Jeff. Unmute Jeff and ask your question. <laughs> I was just wondering, obviously, there's going to be pent up demand. Yeah. But again, the usual grill in the room, is there going to be inventory to support the it demand? It doesn't matter oh. about inventory. And and I'm speaking to a chair. It doesn't matter what what in, what what inventory is. Um, here's the thing: when when let, let's just take the um the example, the the uh the theory, the the circumstance that rates come down. Okay, when when are rates going to come down? Nobody knows that. Um, you know, all the gurus in the mortgage industry thought that rates would be around five percent at the end of this year. Well, they were wrong. They were right about inflation coming down right and they they thought okay inflation comes down and the 10-year treasury follows inflation and mortgage rates follow the 10-year treasury they're right about all that but you know where they got it wrong they didn't realize that the spread between the 10-year treasury and the mortgage rate was going to be higher than normal because the investors don't want the risk and they know people aren't really going to hang on to these these higher rates they're going to refinance pretty soon they're not going to make much on the loan and so they had to have this higher spread um so they didn't they didn't put that into consideration. So predicting rates, bad game to play. However, in, when rates come down, let's just think about the world when rates come down. OK, when rates come down, this is this is what I see happening is that the trade up seller is going to list and buy. Right. They're going to list their home and upgrade. They're tired of their home. This is like huge. This is a huge market. I mean, I, I could even ask you guys, like, how many sellers do you have that want to sell? They don't need they they want and they need an extra bedroom. They want to be on the water. They need to move across town, but they can't because they're sitting on this low rate and they just can't do it. How many of those clients do you have, right? How many buyers do you have? First time home buyers that are waiting on prices to come down, are waiting on rates to come down. Like it's crazy. So when rates come down, let's just think about this hypothetical situation that the trade up seller lists and then upgrades. So what does that do to the market in terms of inventory? Well, they're adding one to inventory. But then they're taking one away from inventory. So it's a net even for inventory. Okay. So that didn't do anything to inventory, but it created two uh, transactions. So inventory stayed the same overall, active listings, 
but we we have two we have two plus on the transaction board. Okay, so activity has increased. Now we've got two deals, two commissions, really four, because there's a buyer and seller on each deal. Okay, but then the first time home buyers come in, they rush the market. They take a property off the market, but they don't add a property to the market. So what does that do to active listings? It brings it down, but it created a transaction. So what happens, in my opinion, when rates come down is we're going to see transactions spike. Transactions are going to go boop, but active listings are going to come down. Okay, so inventory doesn't have to come up. Uh, who was it, Jeff? Inventory doesn't have to come up for in, for 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 activity and and transactions to spike. See what I'm saying? We could live um, in, we we could live in a world. I'll take your question in a second. We we could live in a world where where inventory goes down, but our businesses all explode. See what I'm saying? So so it, we, you have to realize we can't control rates or or inventory or any of that stuff. What we got to do is our our best to make sure the most people that own property in our market know who we are and feel like we're their friend and never forget us. That's all. That's all we can control. That's all we can do. And then we let the market kind of play out however it plays out. We're just here to help and service our people. I, I, whatever inventory does or this, that, I don't know, don't care. Right? Transactions are going to spike regardless. They're going to come back. Go ahead. I'm listening. Linda, was it you? Who had a question? Um, I've got a question. Uh, I've been farming two farms for 15, yeah. 25 years. Two and farms, um, 15, 25 years. Got it. And uh, I, I've gotten a lot of sales from it. But over the last couple of years, I've had zero response to my marketing. And I've, I just can't afford to do it anymore. Just what wonder what your is it. Um, a lot of flyers, basically magnets, uh, neighborhood update. Yeah, have you called those people? Do you, do you ever call through the subdivisions? Uh no. Why wouldn't you? Uh and I'm not a great um, phone guy, I guess, and I'm not a door knocker. <laughs> Maybe I should be. Well, Jim, let me no. let me just let me just give you my my two cents. The 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 premise of your job as a real estate agent is to talk to people you do and don't know to help them buy and sell real estate. So so your job is to talk to people that you do and don't know to help them buy and sell real estate. So why don't you just do that? Sending out mailers is great, guys. Doing videos on social is great, guys. Um, you know, do you know okay, have so a good board. Having billboards and, and doing open houses and doing all this stuff is great, guys. But if you're not talking to people that you do and don't know all day long to help them buy and sell real estate, you're not doing your job. You can't just sit around the office and send mailers out and be like, you know, my business isn't doing anything. Like, did you expect, did you expect, Jim, for that to like blow your business up? It used to. Well, well, I don't want to dig into like what that business actually looked like. Okay. But let me just say it could be 15 times bigger. It could have been 15 times bigger then. And you could be blowing up right now. See what, what you got to realize is that th th this is kind of far out there to think about it like this. Okay. I'll, I'll break it down from the furthest out of, in, in space all the way back down to maybe around the moon. And then we'll bring it down to earth. The first thing is, is how many, how many humans do you guys think will ever live on the planet? There's, there's like 8 billion now, right? How many humans do you think will ever live on the planet? You think it'll hit a trillion? Who knows, right? Half a trillion, a hundred million. I mean, I mean, a hundred billion, 200 billion. I don't know. Okay. A lot. What are the chances that another human being lives during the same time that you do not only that in the same area you do what are the chances pretty much like one in uh, a trillion let's just say if there's going to be a trillion people ever live on earth one in a trillion <laughs> there's the chances that this person lives next to you in the same time 
All right. If you are on a a, a bus in Paris and you're on a three hour, uh, uh, you know, train ride and there was this guy sitting across from me, mean mugging, looking really mad. And you're like, man, that guy just seems angry. I don't even want to talk to him. Something happens. You drop something, you bump in and you got to start talking and come to find out they're pretty nice. And then you're like, where are you from? And they're like, D.C. As soon as he said D.C., wouldn't you feel like automatically connect, like you have a connection with this person now? You're in Paris. You realize that you're both from D.C. Wouldn't you be like, wow, we're both from D.C. You feel this connection with them, right? It, it, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is that anyone in your market that lives anywhere should literally be looked at as family. Like you should look, you should look at that. They're, these are your neighbors. Like what are the chances that, that a human lives in your area? It's like so low. It's, it's, it's like lightning striking the same spot 15 times. Um, hey Ricky, I watched one of your videos where you discussed like a little call warm up you used to do. I'm sure this is not the first time you've said somebody say that they don't love making phone calls. Um, but you sort of said you made a lot of cold calls, not even to relationships that knew you, you called the, the mean monger guy on the bus and just, started a conversation and worked to create a relationship, but you kind of shared, it was like a four or five people on the front end that you would call just to get things started and get yourself in the right headspace. Could you kind of share them? Like what might jumpstart those phone calls for them? Do you remember what you said? I can um, remind you if you don't, but I mean, there, there, there's a couple of different things you can do. Um, you know, you can take the first couple of calls to do follow up with people that you're currently kind of following up with. Right. Um, you know, even past clients, call a couple past clients, check on them, see how they're doing or whatever, and kind of warm up a little bit, kind of helps you kind of, you know, get past, kind of get warmed up. And now you're kind of ready to roll. Um, You know, send them mail. See, see, Jim, you're in the perfect position because you've sent these people like, like <laughs> calendars and postcards and flyers forever. You know, <laughs> like when you call them, they know exactly who you are. You know, you're gonna be like, hey, I'm Jim. I'm the guy that, you know, did you get my calendar? They'd be like, hey, Jim, yeah, I've been getting your stuff for years. Thought you'd never call. Right. <laughs> um, you, you've got to you've got to reach out to these people or you're just dead in the water, guys. If you're not talking to people all day long about buying and selling real estate, then you're you're dead in the water. It's, it's not it's not going to work. It's not going to work for you, especially in a market like this where, you know, we just had historic pending deals on the report. Um. You know, listen, if you look at all the lead gen activities, okay, every single one of them, okay, um, social media, Zillow leads, um, open houses, um, you know, mail outs, cold calls, um, door knocking, uh, sphere of influence, it, it, just think of every single one of them, okay, every single one of those activities comes right back to the same thing, okay, it's a, those, those are like top line funnel to come right back to the exact same thing every single time before there's a transaction. Okay. What's that single thing that everything comes back to every single time before there's ever even a chance for a transaction. I'm talking conversation. It doesn't matter if it's a Zillow lead, open house lead, you know, you got them on social, you know, whatever it is until you talk to them, nothing will happen. So when I realized that, I was like, oh, okay. Like, you mean I don't have to do all that stuff? I can just call the people I want to do business with and have the conversation right now? I don't have to spend time, money, and energy on all the stuff most agents do? I can literally hack the entire system and just call the people? Because it comes right back to the conversation anyway. Why don't I just have conversations instead of like wasting my time doing mailers and open houses and making videos and running ads and buying Zillow leads and all the stuff that people do. I was like, why do I want to spend time, money, and energy doing that? Those inefficient activities when I could just call the exact person I want to do business with for a penny. Why wouldn't I just do that? Yeah. Personal fear of the phone call is fine, Kendra. But the thing is, is all these things come right back to you talking to them on the phone. It's crazy the amount of, of money, like the thousands of dollars that, that agents spend to try to not make calls, to just turn around and call the leads that they spent thousands of dollars on. It, it, it's, it's crazy, guys. It's, it's, it's a little bit, 
You're trying to get around something that you can't get around. Remember, it all comes back to this same thing, right? So why not in your mind, if, you, if you're like, oh, well, it's a warm lead. It's a Zillow lead. It's a, um, it's a, uh, it's a postcard. It's a, uh, it's, it's a mail out. They, um, it's, uh, it's an open house. It's a warm lead. Okay. Well, if you want to be Mr. Mega Agent, you know, why don't you just do some reverse psychology on yourself? And just take a list of every property owner that owns property that you want to represent and pretend in your mind that they're a Zillow lead or pretend in your mind that they're a open house lead or a, uh, you know, that they that they called about your postcard or whatever you got to tell yourself to get in the mindset that this is not a cold lead. Because guess what? It's not a cold lead. This person lives in, in your area. Like this is your neighbor. You should feel like most comfortable calling these people and saying how you're doing and, and, and introducing yourself and seeing what's going on with them today and letting them know what you do, you know, who you are and that you're here to help. You're not trying to sell them, by the way. You're not trying to see if they want to buy or sell something. You're just letting them know who you are, what you do, and that you're here to help, right? Do, the, do you don't want to do anything? Great. Is there an agent you would work with if you were to do something? No? Well, cool. Well, listen, I'm sure you'll do something at some point, maybe not even for another five or 10 years. Either way, I'd love to, the opportunity to work with you when that day comes. So it'd be hard if I just stayed in touch. Yeah, great. What's a good email? Boom. Weekly email, done. Stack that to the moon, done. Done. So the only thing between you guys and a million dollars a year are thousands of one-on-one -on -one conversations with people in your market. That's it. You can stretch those thousands of conversations over the course of 20 years, 30 years, 40 years for the rest of your life, or... You can smash them all into a good three to five years and be done with it. Get to the million dollars a year and move on to bigger and better things. Buying properties, coaching, speaking, writing, whatever you want to do. The world is your oyster at that moment because you're making a million bucks and you're just doing a weekly email every week and you don't have to prospect anymore. Why don't, why don't we just build that business now instead of like playing around with just sending mail outs forever, hoping that something happens? I don't need to live in a world of hope. Guys, I want to make a million bucks now so I can move on to something else. So, let me ask you a question then. Why, I'm, my ears are wide open. So, you have plenty of people on here. Okay, let's say they want to go make their calls. They go and they pull a database of numbers, you know, through or another source to have the addresses. What are your recommendations for them to get the, new, get the phone numbers and then to be able to scrub them against the DNC list because, you know, this is the D.C. Craig, metro area where we have, yeah. more, so, yeah. we have more lawyers and approaches. So um, I'll put a link right here. Red X discount dot com to get a discount there. And just get Geo Leads Plus. You can get 7,500 property owners of your choice. It marks some DNC. Like it marks the DNCs and you don't have to call them if you don't want to. I call them because number one, they're the highest quality phone number. But number two, I'm not calling to sell these people. Again, I'm not calling to sell them. I'm calling to introduce myself. I'm calling to see if there's something I could do to help them. I'm calling to offer uh, a, fr a friendship. <laughs> I'm calling to see how they're doing and what's going on. If they're thinking about doing anything, if there's something I could do to help. So, um, I'll, oh, here, I'll put this here. I've got a platform where you can get all my scripts and all that stuff for free. Join Ricky.com. Weekly email. My weekly email templates are there. All my scripts are there. Everything. Um, what do you think about door knocking? Because I, I think it's even further than cold calling you're even face to face to the people you meet like it's even here's the better thing. here's the thing it's whatever works for you so like what i'm talking about is i i'm just going to call everybody that doesn't work for everyone i understand that i'm empathetic towards it if you want to crush it on social media and it works and, and i know people that sold a hundred million dollars several agents sold a hundred million dollars on youtube and tiktok in the past couple years um you know if that's what you want to do great for me, social media kind of attracts more buyers than sellers. So it, everybody has to make a decision, right? You know, everybody's going to make money at, say, 7 o'clock at night. 
the question is, are you going to be home chilling with your family, eating dinner while eight of your, you know, 21 listings are being shown, right? Or are you going to be the agent on TikTok who's out showing the properties at seven o'clock at night because you got a bunch of buyers coming in? See, we see we have a choice of how we want to structure our business and everything. As far as door knocking versus cold calling versus open houses, right? It's what works best for you. I don't care what you do. The bottom line is if you're not talking to people that you do and don't know to help them buy and sell real estate, you're dead. You're not doing nothing. You're not being productive. You're not doing nothing. Nothing. So like if if you like if you like door knocking, go knock yourself out. I never door knock because I grew up roofing houses and I'm like, I'm not going to go out in the sunshine if I don't have to. <laughs> like I got enough of that growing up. If I can sit in the air conditioned environment and just like click a few buttons and talk to hundreds of people, well, by all means, that sounds like the most efficient thing for me to do. If I go door knock and three people don't answer, I've got to walk to each house. Hell, I could have dialed like 30 numbers during that same time at the office sitting in the air conditioning. That's just me. You may love door knocking. If you do, Go crush it. I, I don't care what you do. Just do something. Yeah. I mean, door knocking could be even with commercial. Like you don't need to be door knocking to homes. You could be door knocking to retail stores, people who own little boutiques. They're, they could be also sellers and buyers too. And it's maybe better to reach them in the day. You know? Figure out, listen. All of the okay. If you take the weirdest prospecting methods that you've ever heard of, okay, you could guys can type something in if you want to. Like, what's the weirdest, craziest, strangest lead gen activity you ever heard of? I promise you, the craziest, weirdest ones, even those people are making a million bucks a year off of them. Every single lead gen activity works. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you, oh, we'll do the door knock the commercial people. Don't door knock the commercial people. I don't care. But you you better, again, just talking to a th thousands of one-on-one -on -one people. <laughs> Whatever gets you to talk to thousands of one of, of people one-on-one, -on -one, you know, over the next, you know, three to five years to get to that million bucks a year. I don't care what the path is that you choose to do it. You got to figure out what works best for you. I can't do that for you. You know, but whatever you can tell yourself, you know, to go do it. Great. Go do it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Ricky, you no. mentioned uh, you had uh, one, I guess, an admin person, in ISA. Um, at what point did you bring that person on and how did it expand? I, did, I never had an it? ISA. I never had an ISA. Nobody ever made calls for me. Um, I brought on an assistant to handle all my admin stuff. So I had, when I got to 30 active listings, I couldn't handle all the showing requests from other buyers from, from other agents trying to show my listings. And it bogged me down. I couldn't do my prospecting. I couldn't do my, all my stuff I wanted to do to continue to build my business. So that was the first. So it depends on what the bottleneck becomes in your business. If you're chugging along and you're doing two deals a month and you're handling everything on your own, great, you're good. But when you get to five and 10 deals a month and you find those bottlenecks in your specific business, that's going to be different than my bottlenecks. It's going to be different than Craig's bottlenecks. It's going to be different than Jim's bottlenecks. Everybody has a different bottleneck in their business from how they operate. And so whatever that bottleneck becomes, that's what you hire somebody to take over. And then you start handing them everything else once they take that off your shoulders. So she came in, she started setting up the showings for agents wanting to show my listings. And then I started handing her all the transaction coordination stuff and then all the MLS stuff. And, you know, all the, then she started doing the postcards and all the other things for me. So bottleneck, and then you kind of reverse it into all the other things that, uh, that, uh, that you need them to do. So a follow up on that then. So how do you, what would you say as far as going from that two deals a month, getting stuck at that to blowing it out and obviously talking with a lot of people uh, and getting a lot of people in your database is a big yeah. part of that, but anything else you can. No, there's nothing else. See, that's the simplicity of it. People hear what I'm saying and they're like, Oh, it can't be that simple. It is that simple. If you're, if you're stagnant in your business, that means you quit building your database. You just quit building. You quit talking to people you don't know, adding them to your database and then doing your weekly email and all that stuff. You, you quit building. That's it. When you see these agents that make 200,000 every year, forever, they never go above that. They just make that forever. And they don't know why 
they're living in a mirage because they're getting business and they think any day their business is going to take off, but they quit building their database. They built their database up to the point that they're making 200, then they quit. Then they're just living off the database. When you get to where you're living off your database, you're going to make the same amount of money every year. So if you build your database up to a million bucks a year and then quit, you live off the database, you make a million bucks a year every year. That's what happened to me. If you, um, it, it, if you're stagnant, it's because you quit building your database. So continue building your database, putting people in there, you know, have your lead gen activities that work best for you, you know, time block those, crush those, you know, meet new people, create new friends, put them in your database, continue marketing to them. So they never forget who you are. It's real simple. How, how many phone calls do you make a day um, in average just for us to have an idea about well, back, back when I built my business, we didn't have dialers. That's what's so crazy about what's happening right now. We didn't have auto dialers. So I had to hand dial, you know, this is like the early two thousands, late two thousands, the early 2010s, you know, when I was really in my building stages. So I would dial a hundred a day and it took me from nine to three. And a lot of people say, Oh, I hand dialed a hundred numbers in a couple hours. Bullshit. Like I did that, I did it so many times that I know how long it takes to hand dial a hundred numbers. Okay. It takes that long. Um, and then I would do handwritten letters from like from from you know, after three, I would do handwritten letters. I would follow up with people, do some emails, and then about five o'clock, I would start looking up numbers to call the next day, which took me like three hours to look up a hundred numbers because I did it one at a time on Spokio.com, Bigfoot dot com whitepages.com google i had to look all these up one at a time i didn't have red x and the data to be able to go click click boom and get thousands of people's cell phone numbers and then click another button and auto dial them 100 an hour it's crazy but uh i, I wouldn't i you're, you're muted but i wouldn't um i wouldn't focus on um how many i would focus on how many hours i committed to make the call so you can't control if people are going to answer not answer talk to you for 30 minutes you can't control all those all those different things, but you can control, hey, I, I said I was going to make calls from 9 to 12. I'm going to make calls from 9 to 12. I'm going to make calls solid from 9 to 12. No matter what happens, you know, I'm going to make calls during that time. Um, And, uh, you know, you may have a call session where you have three people talk to you for 30 minutes this time. Next time you you talk to, you know, way more people. They There were shorter conversations. Just put the hours in. And just don't worry about the results. Just do your best to try to become a better communicator. Every call session, you learn a little bit about how to talk and kind of what worked and what didn't work and how to make people feel comfortable with you. And you use that on the next call session. And then you get better that call session for the next call session. You use that to get better for the next call session. That's, so commit the time is the most important. Exactly. Just the hours that you decided to do it. A, a good like back of the mind goal is to make five new friends a day with property owners. If you make five new friends a day with property owners, 250 working days a year, that's 6,000 over five years. You got 6,000 friends with property owners that are getting a weekly email from you on the same day of the week forever with your opinions on stuff, not generic stuff. Don't hire a company to do your email for you guys. Sit down and write it yourself based on what how, how you're feeling about stuff. New listings, new restaurants, market stats, good deals, articles, developments coming. Put your stuff in there. And I actually have a four-week um, um, email template system. And I actually have four weeks templates where you can just plug and play. If you go to that joinricky.com link, yeah, it takes you to Goldbar. Goldbar is the platform. It's all for free there. I've got, and you can see every email I did for a year to my clients for the past year. You can see every email I did. Look at it, get ideas, use that stuff. Okay. Boy, just to answer your question, and Ricky just did that. The Gold Bar is a training platform, so uh, it's got all his stuff on there. It, yep. it's not a, it's not a scam. <laughs> That's it. Yep, I got it. Thank you. I don't okay. see the scripts, however, but I'll find them. Yeah, it's right there. As soon as you make an account, it's right there. It says scripts and email templates. You, you know, Ricky, I, just to summarize what you've been saying is, is it, it all comes back to talking to people. And I, I think that that 
everybody signs on to, to programs like this, hoping that you're going to tell them something that they can do that's going to make it so that they don't have to talk to people. <laughs> and what I hear you saying for the last 40 minutes is you got to talk to people. And I, I think that we're just resistant to that. And it, it's well, just, we do, uh, we do have a, uh, I, I did create a challenge where we do handwritten letters first. Uh, the handwritten letters actually do get listings, but the magic behind it is to call after the letters. So this has been a one size fits all, whether you're an introvert an extrovert, if you're new, if you're experienced, if you want to ramp up your business and really get straight to the source of property owners and everything, uh, we developed this program where we're doing 30 day listing challenges right there on that gold bar platform uh, every month, uh, weekly calls, the letters, the phone calls. Uh, we keep a leaderboard of how many, whoever gets the most listings, we give prizes uh, and all that good stuff. So we have something that even the extroverts don't want to make the calls makes it easier because they do the letters, they get, they get some, they get some calls, but then it's easier to make the calls because you're calling about the letter you sent. So it makes it a little easier, um, you know, for some people, but, but again, you know, the, the, the people that really blow this business out of the water, they just have no fear. You know, they're just happy to call anybody about anything, to talk to them, see how they're doing, see what they could do to help them. And they do it very consistently. Yeah. I, I think people are scared to call because they feel like they're going to ask for something. But actually, you're not asking for something. You're offering something. Wouldn't matter if I was asking for something, offering something. That, that again, is just another um, excuse, um, another cop-out people use. Um, doesn't matter what you're doing, what you're calling them about. Call them. Call them. Treat them like family. Yeah, this is what you guys need to think of, okay? If this were my mom, what would I say? If this were my dad, if this were my brother, if this was my daughter, if, if this was my close family, it's like when, when, uh, when, when you know – if somebody wants to sell something, you're going on a listing appointment. Okay. For example, think in your mind, if this were my mom, how would I handle this? What there are questions I would be asking? What, how, you know, what are my mannerisms? How, how is my body language? What, you know, how am I going to handle this situation? Think, well, how would I treat this person? If it were my dad, if my mom, my cousin, my uncle, my best friend from high school, people I'm very comfortable with people I'm really close with people I love. When I got that, when I realized that my prospects needed to be treated exactly like I treat my family, that's when my business exploded because people felt it because I wasn't there to make money. I was there to really figure out what they're trying to do and why and help them do it. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> Hey, Ricky, why, we're, it, we're, it, it, it is amazing. And that's why I decided to write books and start coaching and stuff because no coach talks about this stuff. So I want to just uh, pivot over to the, to the lawsuits. A lot of people are worried about what they can and can't say and how they should approach that. Um, I'm, I'm kind of the opinion that we just keep doing business for the most part, like we've been doing business, but what do you think? You absolutely do. It's really a non-issue um at all you handle every situation as it comes if somebody brings it up and wants to not char not pay a buyer agent commission or something fine you know we call those pocket listings <laughs> we call those for sale by owners if you don't want to pay you know if you don't want to offer to pay the buyer agent um you know what's so crazy is when all this started it, it, it's really it's really it's it's just a money grab guys it's just it's just and they don't really care what happens to the industry and stuff the the uh, it's like the, the sellers agreed to pay this commission. Um, they were happy with what they netted. Um, you know, they, they were happy to pay the five or 6%, regardless if there was a buyer agent involved or not, you know? So it's like, you were happy to pay the 5%, you know, when it was me, why, why do you care if I take some of the 5% that you agreed to pay me and, you know, another agent gets some of that? Why do you care so much? You know, if I sell it, my, if I represent the buyer or whatever, and, and I get the full commission, you don't care, but you do care if there's a buyer agent involved. It's it's no, it's no more money that you paid. It, it's really just a money grab uh, for everybody, and um, I, I think it'll get shot down, honestly. But you know, you, you never know with the way you know everything's ran in in, in you guys' city. 
you, you, you never know how, how all this could play out. Um, there's people that think that, um, you know, MLSs will change the rules to where you can't offer a buyer agent commission. We'll just put it in the contract. Um, you know, we make the offer. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's really a non-issue. If, if they, if they change the rules dramatically, we could lose a lot of agents who just are scaredy cats. Let's just call them. They're just going to run away. They don't know how to handle and how to adapt. What's going to happen is the agents that stay are going to get more market share, and they're going to do they're going to they're going to do far better than we were doing before. Because think about it: if they ban commissions from MLS, the only reason to really post your listing there is to syndicate it to Zillow. Well, if 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 they ban buyer commission, now Zillow isn't making money on their flex program for giving buyer leads. So then they're not going to allow the syndication. I wouldn't think that Zillow would allow the syndication at that point because they're going to want to pay to play now. Now they're going to want us to pay to put our listings on Zillow. Well, in that world, at, at, what's the point of of putting a property on MLS now? You, it, you're, not, you're not advertising to the other agents because you're not paying them anything. And it's not getting syndicated to Zillow for, to, to get to the buyers. So now what's the purpose <laughs> of putting the property on MLS. There's not going to be one. So now in that world, now we live in a world where buyers don't see every property for sale in one spot. So now what happens? Commissions go up. Why? Because now buyer's agents who actually have a buyer are far more valuable in a world where the buyer can't see all the listings. And now if you got if you got a, a, a inside to an agent that has a, a, a seller who might sell or even you have a seller yourself, you're looking at the seller like, hey, I got a buyer, but what you going to pay me? Because I can just take my buyer to another listing, right? So in that world, it's going to be kind of like commercial is now. Re the residential world will kind of turn into what commercial actually is right this second, where things are very pocket listed. Things are kind of under the radar. Um, and commissions actually are a little higher. You, you just It takes a little more savvy of an agent to live in that world because um because the world we have been living in is is a lot simpler but and it's great for consumers because they get they get to see everything and that's what's so good about it and they get representation without coming out of their pocket so the world now is like really really incredible and and they're just trying to crush it and, and crash and burn it but in in the opposite world um you know worst case scenario and stuff you know, the more business savvy agents will really do well, really do phenomenal. You basically create your own market where you have your own buyers and sellers. <laughs> you pretty much double end everything just about. You may have some agents you're friends with that you do deals with. And um, that's worst case scenario, though. And like the agents that are just like buyers agents and they get handed leads from Zillow or team leaders and stuff like that. Those agents may be the first ones to go. You know, it's going to it's going to be the the top the top business savvy agents that that will stay so that i mean look if you're a buyer type agent go become a uh a, a business savvy agent you know that that can go out there and get listings at will you know that get, you go ahead and start sharpening your skills to go out there and become one of the greatest listing agents that the planet's ever seen Hold on, guys. I got a little um special guest. I think we're watching a family moment here. <laughs> He's shy. Guys, you're watching somebody who's got his values in the right place. <laughs> oh, you found the elf. Where was he today? <laughs> brought you some christmas tree cookies all right cool <laughs> so um yeah listen nothing to worry about on that lawsuit thing um it'd actually be fun if that happened we lose a ton of agents and um it would be it would be a lot of fun because we'd make more money so bring it on <laughs> I like that attitude. Anybody else have any questions right now? I fought one on the uh, 
on the chat, uh, looking to get some ideas. We see listings coming out already where there's an offer of buyer commission much less than what I have, let's say, in my uh, representation contract. And so any ideas, Ricky, on how to work that back into the contract, into the offer, uh, conversations with the seller's agent, which seem to be, you know, forbidden up to now. Wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about like what the, um, what the uh, listing agent is getting. Cause honestly, we don't know what the listing agent is getting or we don't, we don't really yeah, know no. what the listing agent is getting. Like here you see the buyer agent commission. I don't know what the, like there's listing agent commission. The buyer agent commissions are like 2.4 and then I'll go to closing the buyer agent, the listing agent's getting like, you know, four or some four or five or something. This is like, what in the world is going on here? Yeah. But, um, I would just put it in the contract. Like what, what do you normally get on a, for a buyer? What's your, what's your standard? What are you happy with? What do you, what do you normally want on a buyer agent commission? Well, we see a lot of two and a half. Two and a half. Yeah. So you could put two and a half. I would just put in other provisions, seller to pay buyer agent commission of two and a half percent or 3% or whatever it is that you want. You might want to start out at three and then negotiate down if you have to, you know, or something like that. But I would just start putting it in the contract every time. You know, un unless it's stated on MLS, you know, that it's two and a half or three or long, unless, unless it's a standard deal, you know, yeah. and everything's like it normally is. But if it's one of these like discounted uh, one-offs or zero or whatever, put in the contract, you know, and then let them figure it out. They need to figure out what they need to counter back at to cover your fee, et cetera. Okay. Thanks, Ricky. Yeah, ma'am. I have a quick question for you. Mm -hmm. um, over the last, well, first of all, back up to that point. In Maryland, we cannot add commission to the contract from our buyer. So that's a big no-no. But, um, but as far, I mean, on the I offer mean? to the seller, we can't get into that. Um, but is on the it, other part, I was going to say is, it, is, is, can you hear yeah, me? You cannot include your compensation as a buyer's agent in the offer from the buyer to yeah, the seller. Yeah. Is it, is it a, is it a state rule? Is it a yes. local MLS rule? It's a state rule. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, yeah. So that, that's something you have to kind of tackle and try to figure out, um, figure that out. Um, there are ways around it, but okay. you can't specifically state it. Okay. So anyway, um, over the last two years, my business has been predominantly death, divorce, downsizing, and transfers since the interest rates started going up. When do you, and I'm thinking we still have another two years of that till the pain point gets the, to where um, the sellers that are in the house with the lower interest rates are willing to give that up. Mm. Do you see anything different than that? Than what? There being a long time before they decide to sell? Yeah, because like I said, most of my business this year was death, divorce, downsizing, and okay. transfers for my yeah. listings. Yeah. The ones that had to. It wasn't yeah. a choice. Yeah. That's the only people doing deals right now, people that have to. Um, so your question is, how long do I think it's going to be before the trade-up sellers start selling? Yeah. I think they're going to start selling in January. They're, it's going to be a trickle effect. Because what what's what's happening is, is we've been a year and a half worth of higher rates, longer than that, actually, of higher rates. And so what ha what happens, I mean, the same thing happened back in the 80s and stuff, like people become accustomed to these higher rates. You know, they kind of get used to the fact that rates are going to be higher. Um, we'll see fluctuations like it's been it's it was at eight and then it got down close to seven. You know, it'll probably go back up some, but it'll, it, but it's going to hover around here and people are just going to finally just see every day they hate their current home more and more and more. OK. <laughs> And so it just gets to the point where they're like, okay, screw it. We're just going to go for it, you know, and maybe they get a buy down where they get the rate down into the fives, you know, and they're like, okay, we can swallow this. So I, th I think it's just going to be a trickle. Uh, if rates come down quite a bit, we'll see like a big rush. But I, I think outside of the big rush, if that ever happens, if we ever see like a, a drop all of a sudden outside of that, I think it's just going to be a trickle. I don't think we're going to see like this just massive, like, okay, you know, you know, in in August, we're just going to see a ton of like trade up sellers. I just think it's going to be like this trickle that happens 
And I think it's going to start in January. I think people are finally, after New Year's, they're going to be like, okay, this is the year. We're going to do this. We're tired of waiting. We can't wait anymore. Our our, our daughter is three now and, 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 and two, and we've got to have another room. We can't wait anymore. And so then what happens is the people that used to not be the need to people now become the need to people, right? And, and then rates don't matter as much. So I just think it's going to be a more of a trickle with with those. Um, but 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 a but a nice trickle, not just like a little trickle. It's going to be like a nice flow uh, trickle. Hey Ricky, outside yeah. of the weekly, once you've connected with uh, um, uh, uh, that's local all, that's land, all. that's all you have to do. Um, that it does all the it does all the heavy lifting for you. That weekly email right. does all the heavy lifting for you. You don't have to. Uh, you know, I, I used to I used to try to send uh, Christmas cards, and I would do um, I would do uh, I would do yearly check ins with like my top two hundred clients. I did that for a couple years as I was in the building stages, but then I got to where I was too busy to even do those things. And come to find out, it didn't matter anyway. They loved when they talked to me the first time. The great first impression I gave them was everything. Then the weekly email kept them kept me in front of them until they decided to buy or sell. Did that process win everyone over? No, no process is going to win everybody over, but it will win a lot of people over, especially if you treat them like family. So it's that family feel every time they communicate with you, that family feel when they call you out of the blue and, you know, 17 months and they just want to know what's sold in their neighborhood or something. And you get right back to them. You don't try to sell them. You get them the information. It's just doing those things where they just feel like, man, he just really takes care of me. Whenever they need something, just that's what keeps them coming back. It's not necessarily, you know, the the closing gifts and the, uh, you know, the check ins and the stuff like that. One thing I did love to do and I put it in my weekly email a lot was I just asked a lot of people to lunch, like anybody that uh, would be willing to sit down and have lunch with me. I was just if I could have lunch five days a week with clients and pay for lunch and just sit down and just get to know them better and, and enjoy some time and. Um, you know, talk about real estate if they wanted to, whatever, the more of those I could do, the, the, the better, because I'm just deepening those relationships and stuff. So it's like the weekly email should be your foundation, your bread and butter, um, for the nurturing process. And then anything you do on top of that is just consider that a bonus. If you do a yearly check-in, if you do a Christmas card, if you do a lunch, um, whatever the extra little things you do, you know, social media. It's like you make the weekly email the foundation, sprinkle social media on top, you know, like like salt and pepper, like, you know, the, the weekly email is is the main course and 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 the 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 daily little videos are are just kind of like, you know, the extra little toppings um that kind of make it make it a little bit cooler because they're like, oh, I get his emails. Oh, I'll see him on social. But um yeah, that How did you decide? literally could be all of it. How did you decide on weekly versus any other you know what it was i just listened to my clients um back in 2007 when i started getting back in the game i got so many messages from people who wanted a weekly list of foreclosures because foreclosures were big back then so they wanted this weekly list of foreclosures so i started sending this weekly list of foreclosures to all these people that asked for it it was like 10 or 20 people at the time and i was like you know what i'm gonna start sending this to everyone in my database which was like 500 people at the time I'm going to start sending this to everybody every week. So it started out this weekly report of foreclosures where I was also given some extra market information, doing a little self-promotion, some new listings I was getting and stuff like that. And then over time, as the uh, foreclosures kind of dwindled and went away, I just continued to send it every week and it kind of morphed into this market report. And then I just got better and better and better at it. But it actually originated from back then. And I was just listening to my clients. That, that's what they wanted. And um, the rest kind of just fit into place. And I didn't even realize it, but what I was doing was building a brand. I didn't know that that's what I was doing. I was building a brand with the people that get the email. And actually, I was doing social media. You see, email is social media. It's a place that you post original, consistent content to stay in front of people, yada, yada. It, it, it's a different platform. It's a different format. But it's the same thing as social media. It's like I didn't even realize it that I was doing social media doing the email that I was building a brand doing the email. I didn't realize all this at the time, but looking back, that's exactly what I was doing. Man. Well, I 
can't thank you enough. I think everybody who's sitting on this call, Ricky, has gotten tremendous value. I mean, I took pages of notes myself. Um, a couple of things I carried away from it were it doesn't matter what you do. Just identify your thing, your most efficient thing. Do it efficiently and do a lot of it now to prime your pump to get ready for the next year. And uh, every single people, I, I've scrolled through the whole Zoom, every single one of you is going to make a million dollars. It's a matter whether you're going to make it in six months, a year, or 10 years. And that road is paved with conversations. And the person that's in charge of that, the exciting news is you. Yeah. Um, and so I hope that that came through uh, today. Ricky, we can't thank you enough. I know they can connect with you on YouTube. You put the links in there for the Join Ricky. If they want the Red X discount, uh, yep. they search your name on YouTube, right, to find you yep. if they want to sort of follow you and get you on there. What else should they do or how else can right they stay here, connected right with here. you? Right here, I forgot about this. You can text me here too, uh, 251-312-8844, and uh, I'll send out you know daily little motivational text messages, but that'll that'll also send you the coaching program and all that stuff. And I, I look at all those replies. I write all those text messages, so – you can also hit me up there, but Hey, enjoyed it guys. You guys have a good rest of your day. Um, hope you got something really good out of this and, uh, let me know if there's something I could do to continue helping you guys. Thanks Ricky. We really appreciate it. See you guys. Appreciate you big time. Thank you. Thank you. I 35 with a top down. Quit to tell a hater they should get like me. Seem like everybody want to be the boss, but it costs and these lanes ain't like me. Drop a